Hello there. Welcome to Psychedelics Today, everybody. My name is David Drapkin, and I'm your host in conversation today with Dr. Roberta Murphy from Imperial College London. We got to chat very impromptu at the Breaking Convention conference at the University of Exeter in April. Uh, I was at the press conference listening uh, to a bunch of experts behind the tables, and Roberta was one of them. And uh, yeah, I just really liked what she said and the vision um, and the clarity that she had in, in how she spoke. So I went over to her and said, hey, I'm David. Do you want to come and record a podcast? And uh, within about half an hour, she grabbed some lunch and there we were sitting down recording. So not much planning, but just great energy um, around what Roberta's is doing, particularly the work she's done already at Imperial College, the psilocybin uh, for depression trials she's worked on with a bunch of other folks there and the research paper she worked on around rapport building and therapeutic alliance, which you may have uh, come across already. Uh, she's also worked on something called the ARC framework, uh, access, reciprocity and conduct with a bunch of folks, including drug science. And yeah, it was just great to meet a psychiatrist that also has training in psychoanalysis and kind of wears both of those hats, especially doing psychedelic work. So she can go deep. Um, with that kind of training. It was great to hear. So before we jump into that, I want to remind you, if you have not yet liked or subscribed to Psychedelics Today on your podcast channel, wherever you listen to this, go ahead and do it. It makes your life easier. And same thing with social media. We are everywhere. So if you want to get all of our latest updates, then you can just find us on uh, any and all channels. Our main website is called psychedelicstoday.com. And there you'll find all of our blog articles, all of our podcast backlog and upcoming events uh, live in person and online. Our trainings live on psychedeliceducationcenter.com. And we've got a few courses coming up as well as some of the evergreens that are always available. And if you would like to send us some feedback, you can email info at psychedelicstoday.com. And if you're feeling generous, please go ahead and make some donations to patreon.com forward slash psychedelics today. All right, without further ado, enjoy the show, everyone. Remap Therapeutics is hosting the second ever Pain and Psychedelics Conference. It is coming up July 15 and 16. It goes from about noon to 5 uh, Eastern, uh, both of those days. So it's a Saturday and a Sunday. And you get to hear from all of the most leading people in the pain space pretty impressive cast of characters. Dr. Joel Castellanos, Professor Jan Ramekers, Devin Christie, Boris Heifetz, Josh Woolley, James Close, Julia Bornman, Professor Imad Damaj, Bob Wold from Cluster Busters, Dr. Emmanuel Schindler, Dr. Michelle Wiener, Professor Greg Corder, Court Wing himself, CJ Spotswood, Jim Harris from Outside Magazine, and um, yeah, it's going to be an amazing event. If you are curious and, and interested in the psychedelics and pain space, check it out. A link in our show notes and on our socials. See you there. Bye-bye. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Psychedelics Today. This is David. Still at Breaking Convention. It's day two. And I am with Roberta Murphy, who I just met uh, about half an hour ago. And say, do you want to come on a podcast with me? And she said, yeah, yeah, all right then. <laughs> so thank you. Welcome. It's great to see you here, Roberta. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, well, I was, um, for everyone listening, I was just watching the press conference. They had a big panel with about eight or nine people there. Um, and yeah, Roberta was talking about some awesome stuff. And I just thought, oh, I really want to try and record with you. So um, let's dive in. So yeah, welcome to go. the show. Um, I don't know much about you. So I haven't done my usual in-depth research so, so let's get to know you can you tell me and everyone listening about you like where yeah. where did you come from originally and what has your life kind of looked like that led you to be at breaking convention today yeah yeah in a nutshell yeah okay. a psychedelic big nutshell. question um so i guess as you can hear from my accent i'm originally from ireland dublin and i was always a bit conflicted should i train to be a psychiatrist go down the medical route psychologist and I guess to cut sort of um, a long story short, in essence, when I graduated and started training as a psychiatrist, I was really sort of, in a way, disenchanted by sort of the work that I found myself doing. And I suppose I just want to kind of say that I have an enormous amount of respect for my psychiatry colleagues, but it just wasn't the work that was sort of close to my heart, I guess. And I've always perhaps 
been interested in sort of alternative approaches to kind of severe and enduring mental health kind of that can range from, you know, breathwork, meditation, psychotherapy, nature and psychedelics. Mm. And I suppose, yeah, all of these things have been things that have been part of my own healing journey as well. I guess, as most people know, those of you who kind of move into a healing modality, it's often about your own healing too. Um, and I think that psychedelics have a lot to offer. And how I came, I guess, to it specifically, it's always been kind of a long-term interest for me. But I think when I was training as a junior psychiatrist through sort of friends, I got connected to Imperial and actually with very little experience, I was offered a full-time job working on the psilocybin for depression trial. And since then, I've worked on lots of different trials and done research and sort of always stayed sort of quite connected with the group. And I suppose professionally, my kind of uh, areas of interest are sort of obviously psychiatry, which is the medical training I've done, but also I've trained in psychotherapy, sort of group, individual. um, And so I've kind of, yeah, I like combining those sort of two areas together. And in a way, psychedelics is quite sort of a nice sort of overlap between the two as well. Do you do any um, private practice work at all? I don't at the moment. I'm I'm full time in the NHS currently. Oh, wow. What kinds of places are you working in the NHS? So I work in a complex trauma team, which sort of are people with quite sort of severe um, histories of trauma, relational, sexual, physical abuse, often kind of, I guess, quite high risk, a lot of suicidality, you know, harm to self, that kind of thing. So that's your day job? That's my day job. So what's the Imperial <laughs> College stuff about? <laughs> So I worked um, on the Imperial trial for, for a couple of years and that was sort of looking at psilocybin for depression. And on that trial, I guess I did a mixture of more kind of medical things like screening and uh, ECGs and that kind of thing. And also sort of the more guiding work. So being in the room, working as a therapist. I mean, if I'm honest, looking back on it, I didn't have the training to do that work really. I sort of had very little therapeutic training. Mm. And so I was, of course, very, you know, lucky and grateful to have had that experience. But in retrospect, I could see the more training I do, the more I realize that in lots of ways I was probably pretty out of my depth. So, yeah, and I've worked on trials for kind of eating disorders and healthy volunteers and also helped to um, train kind of other groups, particularly thinking about things like screening or, you know, those kind of aspects of the work. Wow. That sounds great. Yeah. And what are you working on at the moment? So at the moment, I think... Uh, So I think we were chatting a bit before the sort of I've got kind of two kind of areas of kind of research interest. And so one thing that I'm interested in is the idea of the importance of the therapeutic relationship. Um, So thinking about I published a paper um, and I think that when we were doing the trial, we we all kind of got really interested in sort of what the difference was between those participants who sort of sailed through, had these kind of quintessential psychedelic experiences that you read about, you know, in a Guardian article or, or, you know, in a podcast or whatever, and those that really just didn't, who had sort of a, you know, much rockier journey, who maybe left the trial still very depressed, who felt very stuck and kind of really starting to kind of pick apart the kind of the complexities of the process. And also a question, I think, of sort of, who responds and why or how and what are the kind of mechanisms, I guess, of psychedelic therapy. And so kind of, you know, again, as you're probably aware, there was already quite a lot of research that showed that kind of the acute experience was quite important in predicting kind of outcomes um, in terms of uh, psychedelic therapy. What do you mean by the acute experience? Sorry, yeah. In, so in the, During the, the dosing yeah, session? Yeah, the, the dosing session. So particularly they've looked at things like high scores and mystical experiences mm. or emotional breakthrough. So mystical experience, I guess, is thinking about, you know, sense of sacredness, unity, transcendence, you know. Emotional breakthrough is probably more to do with typical psychotherapy, as, as uh, Leah Roseman actually and made the emotional breakthrough inventory, but thinking about more um, traditional time talking therapies ideas. So, you know, getting into trauma, processing things, kind of, I guess, in a way, bringing the unconscious conscious, you know, th- those kinds of things. So those two measures had been shown to be important, but we sort of took a, a step backwards, I guess, again. And what we thought about was actually, if we were going to put, put our money on sort of who did who did well, in a sense, of leaving depression free and who didn't, then we would say it's something to do with a the therapeutic relationship. So um, if we felt safe, if we felt that they had, you know, good safety and trust in us, then those people seem to have a bigger experience and ultimately do better in the end. 
And actually, that's really not a very clever idea at all, because I you know, of course, all therapeutic modalities, the therapeutic alliance is kind of it, you know, it's kind of the kind of common factor across them all that kind of predicts how people do. And so basically, the the paper sort of confirmed that, which sort of makes sense that people need to feel, yeah, kind of safely sort of contained and held in a therapeutic relationship to let go into what is, you know, often a very vulnerable and challenging experience. So also, I think it's felt like an important piece of research to do because there's a lot of debate at the moment about, well, you know, do people need therapeutic support? Does the person sitting in the room need to be trained? You know, can you have a sort of psychiatrist floating between the rooms? Do people need training? Do people need supervision? Mm. Um, is the psychedelic therapist on its own? You know, there's, there's a lot of kind of debate around about it. So even though in lots of ways, this idea of the therapeutic relationship has been held as sort of integrally important across sort of all kind of cultural, you know, you have your shamans, you you know, it's not sort of unique to kind of Western culture at all. There was something about kind of needing to evidence something that in many ways has been taken as conventional wisdom and not really questioned. So that was kind of the the one area, something. Yeah. So before we dive into that, because there's so <laughs> many different directions to go with therapeutic alliance. Yeah. It's definitely super important. Do you feel like it's the most important determining factor that might be able to explain why certain people in clinical trials or even in real world psychedelic use with the clinician practitioner, is it the most kind of powerful determinant or is it just maybe it's the easiest one in a trial to kind of to study and to break up? Yeah. I mean, actually, I think... When you go into any research in in mental health, it just gets so complex. So, you know, you take something like a construct of therapeutic alliance and you really look at it and suddenly it's sort of like, you know, it bursts open and you realize, okay, but there's a thousand factors that are coming into place in this alone. And so, you know, you think about, okay, who's the therapist in the room? What's their attachment style? What's their disposition? how much training and supervision and their own psychedelics and their own therapy work have they done? Then you have the patient, sort of what's their relational history? You know, what does kind of how easily they build trust, say about the life they've lived, say about the complexity of their difficulties. Okay, so you've got a more complex patient who finds it harder to build trust. And so then does the kind of lack of trust just become a marker of their internal difficulties? So in a way, I think it's a good marker of something, a sort of uh, something that kind of... Yeah. captures many things in one place but really it's sort of just representative of a whole sort of you know plethora of, of different things so you've clearly done a lot of work that's not <laughs> being a psychiatrist so yeah this is more like depth psychology stuff and i don't know and maybe really understanding yeah what determines whether therapeutic al- alliance is positive very positive or neutral or negative yeah so what with where with where your research is our attachment you've said key yeah. So I'd love to hear more about that. And I've, I've actually heard from quite a few researchers that attachment seems to be one of the cross-cutting models mm. that determines efficacy and that we need to, like, I think, keep in mind when we're looking at how someone reacts in a medicine session and just yeah, building that relationship. So maybe to start with attachment, I'm not sure if, if you've thought about the transference and counter-transference aspects of, yeah. of work with psychedelics in particular because... I think that tension that comes to the surface of the person themselves often gets projected onto or kind of explored and experienced and kind of navigated with the clinician yeah. in the space. And that's kind of a part of the work is just to get it out and to say, wow, oh, what is this? With an incu- inquisitive curiosity, <laughs> in a kind of non-judgmental way. So yeah. how are you understanding attachment, transference, counter-transference so far in this work? So I think, um, yeah, I'm really happy that you brought in that idea. So for me, I think the working with the transference, the counter-transference is a really important part of that work. And that is why I do advocate for sort of trained people, both in terms of their own experience and, you know, the training they've done doing the work, because I actually think it's more alive and bigger than even an ordinary therapy session. I mean, I can sort of think of some experiences that I've had So we had um, a couple of patients in our trial who said, you know, so we on in our trial we had sort of a high dose and basically placebo arm. We had a couple of patients who were actually on the high dose arm who said, "I'm on the placebo arm. I got didn't give, uh, you know, I can't feel anything. I didn't get given anything." And I think 
at the beginning of our journey in the trial, we were all sort of in a way quite naive clinicians. And when the first person said, I've not been given anything, you know, in a way we just kind of left there a bit to some Mm. extent. And then by the time we kind of got to the second half of the trial, first of all, of course, we had the idea of like, well, we remember that that person said that and actually they have been given the high dose when we unblinded at the end. But what we realized with what was coming up in the room, you know, what was being amplified by the psychedelic were these feelings of feeling let down, uncared for, rejected, not being chosen, and actually a lot of anger and mistrust. And because we were a bit more, you know, wise, I think by the time we got to that patient, we were able to like do a lot of work with all of those feelings. And that was almost like the first layer of their psychedelic experience. And it makes sense in a way that you might need to kind of work through those mistrust feelings before you sort of get into a deeper layer. And then in the next session, they were able to, I think, because they felt a bit safer with us, let go and have a bit more of a typical psychedelic experience where they sort of visualize things and saw things. And I could, yeah, I have loads of examples, I suppose I could give of things like that where, you know, it was a psychological defense being amplified or, you know, but it wasn't sort of a, you know, somebody having a, a typical psychedelic experience. But, and I've heard from other trials, I think that that can often then be mistaken as sort of resistance or like nothing's happening but there's always something happening. It's just sometimes it's a little bit more nuanced or a little bit harder to kind of pick up and work with, but there's, there's always something happening. You just might have to like zoom in a bit to see it. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what you were just sharing there brings a, two things into my head around the therapeutic relationship and alliance. Mm-hmm. Cause you're saying on one level, it helps a person, a client to open up, to almost kind of give permission yeah. to themselves that I feel safe enough to go inside my kind of hidden, painful, repressed, whatever it might be, uncertainty and pain. And then secondly, I feel like it also makes it possible that if a client ended up having, say, a challenging experience, that the reliance, the, the, the relationship's there so to kind of help them through it. So hopefully improving the outcomes if they did have a challenging experience to kind of work through it because you've got that report already. But maybe also to reduce the probability of having a challenging experience because you've got that report and that relationship built in the first place. So mm. is that would that be is that how you're thinking? It can do both of those things? Yeah. I mean, I guess I think one of the difficulties with the sort of idea of a challenging experience and um this is one reason why I find I kind of have moved away from using uh, some challenging experience sort of um, questionnaires is that um, I think things get really sort of lumped in together. And I think this is one of the thinking for Lior developing the emotional breakthrough inventory is that there's a difference between a challenging experience that occurs is processed and worked through um, versus a challenging experience where people kind of never really work with it it doesn't get processed and they get quite stuck in it and I think one can be helpful and then one are the people who have sometimes sort of long-term difficulties after a psychedelic experience and so I think um yeah I do think that if you have like a good container of a therapeutic relationship it can help people to work through and process and I think if you don't have that it's more likely that you end up with something a bit stuck because I think in order to process, you often need to go in and go deep. And if you don't feel safe to do that, you're just going to come mm. float on the edge in a way and never quite get through, um, which is what you know happens at like a festival or something where you're not really wanting to have an experience like that or planning to have an experience like that. You're not really in the right sort of place for it. So yeah, so I think it can make a difference in that regard. And I think fundamentally that's the difference with psychedelic assisted therapy compared to say talk therapy or SSRIs, you know, psychopharmacology. Yeah. Because it enables you or gives you an opportunity to drop down into kind of what lurks underneath, like yeah. into the, the feeling of it, you know, the whatever might be there. And that's really different. I guess it depends. I actually don't think it's that different from some talking therapies. So I think for things like CBT, but I think if you go into something like a psychoanalysis, mm. they're also of the breakdown to breakthrough kind of school as well. Um, so I think, it de- I think it depends on the school, school of therapy, I guess. Yeah, yeah, maybe let's just jump into it psychotherapy are there any traditions of psychotherapy any models or techniques that so far you're looking at being particularly well suited to helping people kind of go through and break down into that and 
as a clinician to have this kind of relationship with your client? Yeah, so I suppose the... I think that most therapy models have a lot to offer. Um, I guess my therapy training is sort of an integrative one. So I do a mix of um, systemic or family therapy, um, also group analysis, individual therapy. I also have to do mentalization-based therapies, which is sort of an attachment-based mm. therapy and some cognitive behavioral therapy. I think they all offer something useful and helpful if I'm honest, but I do think maybe the kinds of thinking that you might find in things like either group analysis or psychoanalysis, psychodynamic, that kind of more depth relational kind of ideas are probably all very applicable to psychedelic therapy for sure. Yeah. I know that there's some work that was done at Imperial around accept, connect and embody. I think yeah. that was Ros Watts was yeah. involved in that one. Yeah. So acceptance of commitment therapy, I don't know if that's part of I have to say that I, I don't, despite having worked in the trial, I yeah. don't know that much about acceptance and commitment therapy. I've not worked with it myself and I've not, I'm not, not trained in it. So um, definitely I, I can talk a little bit about, about the ACE model, but ACT itself is um, not something that I'm sort of particularly knowledgeable about. Yeah. Little question. Imperial College is amazing. <laughs> so that's not the question the question is what's it like working there with such amazing people like just tell us like who are some of the beautiful people and really yeah. incredible researchers and, and teachers that you've been working with there so um yeah I agree that we sort of have really um I feel very blessed and lucky to have the colleagues in this area that I do and I have to say it's probably sometimes I have you know like any relationship I have my ups and my downs and my sort of not so sure about psychedelic therapy, but I think the one thing that keeps me in are the colleagues. Mm. And we're, yeah, I think we're all quite close as, as a sort of professional group. And I've made, so I moved to London seven years ago and some of the very best friends I have in London are, are from kind of psychedelic therapy. So I won't name names because I feel like I'll forget somebody. And, right. you know. <laughs> oh, that's very nice of you. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I love them very dearly. Yeah. 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 I'm just blown away by, it seems like a golden generation the last 10 years of, yeah. of people coming out of there. Yeah. And look, it's not to say that they're, you know, like any kind of group, there's always, um, you know, academia is quite a sort of hardcore area. There's a lot of pressure. It's a, you know, academia is competitive as well. So it's not to say that it's perfect. And, and sometimes I think, you know, there's something that's quite difficult, I think, about trying to bring something new in. You know, I noticed that when I went back to work in the NHS, there was something quite sort of containing and relaxing about going somewhere when in a way the rules are already in place. They really didn't want you to do anything different than what you're asked to do. And there's sort of, yeah, just kind of this long history. And, but there's something about trying to do something new, pioneering, that is really fun and exciting, but also can feel like quite a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, especially with the weight of the 60s and 70s that exactly. didn't go as planned. Like, yeah. And we're trying to do something differently this time around. Yeah, yeah. And that's a great pivot into, I think, the the ARC framework yeah. that yeah. we spoke about just before. Yeah. Um, so can you just talk to people about where that came from, the rationale for wanting to develop the framework and then what it actually is? Yeah, so I think that the ARC framework was come up with uh, Meg Spriggs, who is a Kiwi, a psychedelic researcher. She's now sadly just returned to New Zealand. And she sort of came over, in essence, to set up the uh, panorexia, which is psilocybin for anorexia trial. Mm. And also Ashley Murphy-Beener, who's training as a clinical psychologist and worked with me on the Imperial for Depression trial and also has a very long history with breaking convention and psychedelic advocacy. And they're both and they're both very interested in um, ensuring that psychedelics are sort of brought in and applied in a way that's sort of safe and ethical. Um, so the ARC was very much their their brainchild. And I suppose that is kind of coming from both drug sciences and Imperial College London. And it stands for access. So that's thinking about the idea that people who are sort of, I suppose, uh, socioeconomically advan uh, have socioeconomic advantage are potentially more likely to access psychedelics um, for a variety of reasons and especially there's a worry that as psychedelics are sort of, for example, legalized, you know, that might become a very expensive treatment and become something that only sort of the privileged can access, which of course like exasperates existing inequalities, which yeah. exasperate mental health difficulties. 
So that's kind of one arm of it is sort of equitable access. The other arm is reciprocity, which is the idea sort of around kind of indigenous reciprocity with a lot of which a lot of people are talking about at the moment. And I think that's to do with ideas of, I suppose, you know, cultural appropriation and also respecting kind of the indigenous wisdom and, and also giving back, I think, to those communities. And then conduct, which is myself and Ashley's sort of area that we're leading on, is really thinking about the conduct of, of ethical practitioners. And that is, in essence, thinking about um, kind of ethical codes and clinical guidelines, because we realized in working on the trials that this work is very complex and it can be very challenging. And I suppose, first of all, we have an idea that actually what often happens in psychedelic therapy is that it is sort of almost marginalized from kind of ordinary therapies or, you know, traditional talking therapies. And there's a lot of wisdom in those traditional talking therapies that is maybe sort of not being applied appropriately and being forgotten about and as if um, we're kind of reinventing the wheel a little bit with therapy. Yeah. But also there are, you know, really particular and unique both opportunities, but also challenges that come with psychedelic therapy that need to be really thought about. And we really feel that people need to have a very um, safe container because these experiences are enormous, you know, and in a way, if you kind of have this sort of very safe, solid container around you, you can really let go. And I think that both the patients and the practitioner need to be supported um, in order to kind of really feel able to kind of go into the experience to the depth that is required, I think, for healing. So we're basically going to think about just sort of the, the fundamentals of psychedelic therapy, but also try and get into the, the nitty gritties. So there's things like the use of touch or consent, which are so complex and so complicated. And what we want to do is sort of, you know, work through these issues collectively. So not just coming from a clinical medical research, but also integrating, you know, all kind of the stakeholders that are around, because there's also an enormous amount of wisdom that is held collectively, like in the psychedelic community. And I think Breaking Invention is like an amazing example of how they bring all these people together and all these different perspectives. And so we hope to kind of, in a way, echo a little bit of that as well in developing the guidelines that they aren't just sort of one voice or, you know, that no, no one person, I guess, has a monopoly on psychedelics and on monopoly on the perspective either. Yeah. So when we're talking about that, the C, the conduct, there's there's a lot there. I kind of feel like there needs to be some other letters put on. <laughs> yeah. Because <clears throat> we, you know, we, we're talking about skills. Yeah. Like interpersonal skills, practical, clinical skills. We're yeah. also talking about insight and self awareness. Yeah. Of the clinician himself and kind of an ethical code. Yeah. Talking about training and supervision, maybe belonging to peer support as well of other kind of clinicians. Where's your hope around how this framework that you're developing on that C piece, where, where would we see that manifest itself when it comes to, say, training of clinicians? Um, just looking here, in, maybe in England, the NHS model, how could it, if it all goes well, where, where would this training and education about the conduct and peace happen and who would deliver that and who would come to receive it when we're kind of mainstreaming psychedelic assisted therapy in, in the National Health Service? Ambitious question, I know, but just <laughs> kind of just as a thought experiment. Yeah, I think it's a really complicated question. I think that there's a lot of debate at the moment about who gets to be a psychedelic therapist. And I think it's difficult to say because I think that I have I have my particular perspective, which is a clinician and somebody who's done, I suppose, quite a lot of training. I've been in my own, as part of my training, my own sort of personal psychoanalysis three times a week for years. And there's, you know, and so in a way I'm I'm biased to say that I do think that people need to be quite deeply trained to work with certain populations, is is a caveat that. But then I also know that, you know, I have my own particular approach and that's not going to suit everybody. So I think in the way that as a, you know, as a client now at the moment, some people will go and find a Reiki healer. Some people will go find a, you know, mindfulness-based cognitive therapist. Some people go see a psychoanalyst. I kind of see that that's probably what's going to happen with psychedelics. And I think that there's a lot of kind of 
debate about kind of what what is the training, who gets trained, you know. And I think that probably psychedelics will become something that will be applied to all kinds of things. And as a kind of therapist, you'll probably have your own approach, which of course is going to be massively dictated by your own personality, your disposition, all that kind of thing. And the right people will come and find you, you know. Yeah. So so I, I suppose I find it kind of hard to say who gets to read the conduct guidelines. They're not going to appeal to everybody. There's going to be people who um, are probably going to massively disagree with what's, what, what's written in them. Myself and Ashley have kind of always had the approach of, well, we're going to stay in our lane in a way. And we are sort of NHS, clinical psychologist, you know, medical psychotherapist. And that's kind of our jam. And not to say that we don't have kind of interest in things like spirituality or transpersonal experiences, you know, but that, you know, we aren't shamans at the end of the day. And we kind of don't really feel like we can write guidelines that are applicable to other kinds of use of psychedelics because so that's kind of the idea, I guess, of like stay in your lane ultimately. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, and it, I'm thinking as well at the same time, this ARC framework could be almost like a a foundational training. Yeah. And then you can build on top of it. So it's almost like this is exactly kind of the basic kind of mandated piece, these three areas, and then build on top of that based on your personality or the kind of clients you work yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. And you can, you know, like anything, you'll pick some things out and say, that's cool, that's for me, you know, that that's not for me, you know. And I think what's, you know, nice about writing something is that it just starts a conversation really and it's going to be an ongoing and evolving conversation we're not we certainly we know the depth and complexity of these processes there's no guidelines you can write that are going to cover for them but it's just sort of you know one step in a dialogue or you know that we're all going to be sort of ongoing having yeah so so before we go i've got two quick questions okay the first one is around the escitalopram psilocybin uh -huh. trial at Imperial that is yeah. kind of really famous, kind of groundbreaking in my humble opinion. And you were part of that with, with your team. Yeah. One aspect of that I'd love to hear about and anything else that's, a, that's one of the key standouts mm -hmm. for you as well, include that. But I was really interested in the secondary outcome measures. Mm. So I don't know how, like, if that also piqued your interest as well. Like, How do we even measure efficacy? What is happiness? What is the meaningfulness? Yeah. What is life thriving? Other than just a reduction in suicidality and depression, like how are we measuring outcome measures of why people are seeking psychedelic therapy? Because I feel like once we've answered those secondary measures, then how do we train people in, in working with clients to kind of inculcate those kinds of qualities? Yeah, I think also that's um, Jessica Yately wrote an amazing paper basically thinking about the complexity and challenging, you know, challenges of trying to do any research in psychotherapy and how, in essence, sort of, you know, a quick change in your depression scores, these measures were built for antidepressants and they're not built for therapy. And that, you know, they're also looking at sort of very short-term changes, but also short-term sort of uses. And is there something not more powerful about sort of your connection to self, your self-reflective ability, your ability to open to experiences. But those are not the kinds of measures that I think pharmaceutical companies or regulators at the moment are, are really set up, I guess, to be interested in. So I think that is a real difficulty trying to do clinical research. There's a real feeling that you're forced to play a game and you're forced to work within a framework that really doesn't suit what you're doing but it's the game that you have to play. And you're right, I think psilocybin did really well in all the secondary measures and things like flourishing, and well-being, and you know, openness to experience. But those measures, well, firstly, I think there was something to do with them not having been registered, that we weren't actually able to even count them statistically for the, for the final publication. But I think regardless, they're just not the measures that get headlines. Yeah, I think it's just the PHQ and the Madras scale that get yeah. a lot of the, uh, you yeah. have to do that just to, in big pharma world. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Okay, thanks for sharing those thoughts. And <laughs> my final question, I, I did a, like one minute of research while I was having lunch at 3.30. Yeah. <laughs> and I saw you did a couple of research work into Parkinson's disease, mm. not yeah. to do with psychedelics. This was before, <laughs> you know, the, the psychedelic stuff. As a medical student. Yeah, yeah, as a medical student. So just as a wee thing, like, what what was your interest in, in Parkinson's and what was that research about? 
and now you know a few years down the track has that popped into your head at all around how you might particularly use psychedelic assisted therapy or just psychedelic medicine to treat people with Parkinson's yeah that's a really interesting question I did the research in Parkinson's when I was a medical student and I think one aspect of medical school that I was really interested in other than psychiatry was neurology and I really loved um, my neurology consultant, uh, Dr. Noel Tuberty, mm. and I did a placement with him for the summer and his speciality area was Parkinson's. And I think that research was looking at people who got Parkinson's quite early, so under the age of 65, and how it impacted on their their well-being and their employment. I have to say that I haven't worked in neurology for a very long time, and I've not thought about psychedelics for Parkinson's Mm. but that's certainly food for thought yeah or for quality of life I mean I guess what comes into my mind is that something that I am really interested in is sort of end of life use of psychedelics I mean I think that's sort of amazingly powerful work and um yeah not kind of a patient group I've worked with but a patient group that I would be really interested in working with as much as I think to explore sort of my own relationship with death and mortality and you know all those things, but potentially that kind of group for Parkinson's would be really interesting. Yeah, because it really affects your quality of life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. All right, well, (laughs) food for thought. (laughs) Okay, Roberta, thank you. This has been a lovely, spontaneous pleasure. Thanks for (laughs) joining us on Psychedelics today. Thank you very much for having me. All right, thanks for listening, everyone. (laughs) Take care. There you go. I hope you enjoyed it. Really nice to get to know Roberta a a wee bit. And it's just so cool what the team at Imperial College are working on. Just brilliant, brilliant research. Very proud of them. Um, And it was awesome just for me just to kind of randomly ask someone to record a podcast and then to say yes. So I definitely recommend doing those kinds of things in life, folks. (laughs) Just uh, yeah, following your, your dreams and intuition and asking wonderful people for a chat. Okay, have a lovely day wherever you are in the world. And yeah, see you the next time. God bless. Hey everybody, it's David here letting you know that we are launching two rounds of Navigating Psychedelics for clinicians and wellness practitioners in July. This is our best-selling group course and it meets live online every week for nine consecutive weeks and this time with our co-founder and VP of Education and Training, Kyle Buller, as the lead teacher. Choose between two separate groups, Wednesdays at 7 p.m., or Thursdays 2 p.m. EST from July 12th and 13th, respectively. Each week, Carl will be joined by a different specialist guest teacher. These include Jasmine Verdi, Angie Leek, Ido Cohen, Juliana Mulligan, Courtney Barnes, Michelle Hobart, and even me. In Navigating Psychedelics, we cover the fundamentals of psychedelic history, science, harm reduction, integration, and transpersonal theories. We then apply this knowledge to real-world scenarios and cross-cutting themes of trauma, addiction, mental health, and integrative wellness practices. Students also get lifetime access to an online education library of 20 plus hours of video masterclasses, ongoing membership to your group's online community platform, and two best-selling journals with street smart guidance, at-home integration practices, writing prompts, and meditations. If you've been wondering how to incorporate psychedelic knowledge and tools into your practice, or even learn how to get started in the field of psychedelics, then this course is for you. To enroll, We'll find out more about the syllabus and structure of the course. Go to psychedeliceducationcenter.com. And payment plans are also available, folks.